hi to everyone around the whole world. I got chocolate in my lap and early this morning I had turned on TV and was flipping through news channels getting depressed about murders, politics, and COVID. And so I went outside to sit in the sun and breathe in the photons and like a magical gift from all around me and many trees at the same time, many birds were chirping so happily in the sun and their happy chirps made me feel wonderful. And then came a longer, higher pitched wail of a red tail hawk and the chorus faded at the sudden emergence of a predator. The big hawk was so beautiful sitting on a branch. It was only about 40 feet away. And like me and all those singing birds, he seemed to be breathing in the photons from the sun too. And then his big wings spread and he flew off. All the birds began singing again and I loved their joy. And I love you. Hey, you guys, I'm gonna put chocolate down because I wanna say celebration we are close to breaking through 170,000 subscribers at this Earth Files YouTube channel. So summer solstice celebration, here we come. Remember, it doesn't cost anything to subscribe. So if you haven't yet, please click on that red subscriber rectangle in the lower right of your screen. And thank you so much. This is a revolutionary time. We are getting closer to that fundamental truth we have discussed in this weekly broadcast. We are not alone in this universe. And my goal is to keep highlighting evolving news in science, environment, real X-Files, while we wait for the headline of this century and all centuries, we are not alone in this universe writ large around the world. And tonight, Let's start out with fascinating medical news. It's called a zombie gene, a new study published in Scientific Reports on March 23, 2021, quote, challenges the widespread belief that brain activity comes to a halt immediately at death or shortly after. Researchers at the University of Illinois in Chicago found that glial cells not only come alive, but also increase in size and grow arm-like appendages hours after a person dies. While the brain neuronal genes are dying down, the zombie genes come strongly alive for at least 12 hours, a new observation that the brain does not quit when the heart stops beating. The researchers found that zombie genes in the human brain seem to come alive to clean up brain tissues after injury, oxygen deprivation, or stroke, close quote. But I also couldn't help wonder if this new medical discovery of the zombie genes that come alive after the human heart stops might also have something to do with helping the soul transition from the container body. News headlines also keep sprouting up about the COVID funding bill's 180-day countdown for the Secretary of Defense and DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, to give Congress and the American people a lot more information about the UFO UAP phenomenon. What we're all waiting for is official information about UFO advanced aerial threats and associated foreign adversaries. Meanwhile, here are recent tidbits from Fox News last Friday night, March 26, 2021, when host Tucker Carlson talked with Christopher Mellon. Mr. Mellon has been a member of Two Stars Academy, TTSA, and was a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. He also formerly served as the Staff Director of the United States Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Tucker Carlson asked, quote, What do you think we're going to learn from the 180-day countdown report? Close quote. Chris Mellon, quote, 
I think it could be profound and transformative, close quote. But he did not give details about what specific UFO ET information is coming that could be transformative. Carlson also asked, quote, why haven't we heard this before? It's a huge deal. It could change our perception of our place in the solar system, in the universe, really. Why hasn't anyone come forward with this prior to June 2021? Close quote. Mellon replied, quote, it's largely been a matter of stigma and people are afraid to discuss it. You know, it's shocking. He also said, I think it's going to raise a lot of questions and send some shock waves. So there is a lot on the plate and I think it is going to be a big deal. Close quote. It will be a big deal if the Secretary of Defense and Director of National Intelligence hold a press conference and finally confirm that humans are not alone in this universe and that our government has known since at least World War II that other intelligent beings have long been in Earth skies, in advanced aerial craft and other technologies beyond human understanding. Next, the SecDef and DNI will hopefully explain what they consider to be advanced aerial threats and foreign adversaries. Military whistleblowers and experiencers of human abductions have referred to non-human alien conflicts as ancient and ongoing between reptilian humanoids, tall blonde humanoids, and a lot of different grays that are both small and tall and mostly artificial intelligence. But who plays on what team? I've talked with you before about my long meeting in December of 1999 with a Defense Intelligence Agency analyst who sought me out after he retired. He told me his job in the DIA was to monitor and analyze the alien presence and conflict on Earth of three competing extraterrestrial civilizations that base themselves on earth, underground, underwater, and inside mountains. He told me the competing aliens have been using earth as a laboratory for at least 270 million years, and that our government has solid proof of that. When I asked him what the proof was, he answered, quote, if I told you, we would both be in great danger, close quote. We need to get past that kind of restriction. But he confirmed that all three non-human groups have been in conflict about terraforming and mining Earth and manipulating DNA in already evolving primates to create a kind of worker slave for the ETs that include the current human model, Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapiens. A similar extraterrestrial conflict is described by Tyler Jones from Gadsden, Alabama, after his abduction by tall blondes from the farm where cattle mutilations were taking place in 1993. Where we left off last week in part one was Tyler being shown telepathic images by the tall blonde Nordic of alien machines that levitated in the air above large blocks of limestone being moved to build pyramids. The largest Great Pyramid of Cheops in Giza has 2.3 million stone blocks and each weighs approximately 2.5 tons. Tyler Jones from Gadsden, Alabama was amazed that the big blocks moved so easily into the air when a black instrument was aimed at the stone blocks. What image did the tall blonde in 2012 show you that humans were making with blonde technology that could levitate stone? They were making a pyramid, and how they're making it is they had a handheld type device that humans did that the blondes had given to them. It was a flat box 
it's maybe eight inches by four inches, had a small handle underneath and what looked like two rods coming out of the front and what looked like maybe dials or screen on the back. And I got an image of a human pointing this box at a very, very large stone and picked it up and was levitating this block towards the pyramid. And then it handed the block off to another human. What were you seeing as the final product of all of these levitated stones? The next image was three pyramids, a sphinx, a lot of different smaller pyramids on the sides. It was Giza, is what it was. But the sphinx, it wasn't the sphinx like today, with a human face and a lion's body. It looked like a lion. Maybe it was changed later. I wonder what the lion means to the tall blondes. I do not know. All the small pyramids around it, all the obelisks, it was amazing. Did the tall blonde put thoughts in your mind about why they built this and what they were doing? I got the feeling that it was a type of power source. Different structures that he showed me were, I guess, landing pads for the craft that they had. Did you see craft that we would call discs or spheres or cigars or triangles moving in and around the Giza complex? Yes, I saw small triangles, maybe the size of a small car, very large triangles, maybe a mile wide, long cigars, maybe almost a mile wide, small discs, big discs, floating above structures at different times of what he was showing me. This was their energy base for the power that they needed for the craft and to mine on Earth. Yes. The next image I remember after Giza was more structures that they either already had built or were building. I saw another pyramid, but it wasn't like the one at Giza. It was a step pyramid. The next thing I saw was another Salon's meeting. A lot of them gathered around and... The blondes told me that they didn't want to do the work anymore. So they decided to create another being to do the work for them. They took what was here on Earth, which was humanoid, and mixed it with their DNA. I saw flashes of things that looked like human, but they weren't. They tried the first time and didn't succeed. Second time, it looked better. Third time, it looked better. And the last time, they came out with us. They came out with us humans. Yes. Did you have any telepathic information from the tall blonde as he's showing you these images of what their relationship is with the greys? Did they make the greys? Did the greys work for them or what? I asked him what they were. The blondes showed me an image of maybe like fish bowls with things growing in them. From what he said, they're genetically engineered. I guess they can just make them whenever they want to, like a worker thing. What were the blonde beings doing here in 2012? Well, as the story went on, as far as the beginning, they created us. But near the ending, after everything was built, they had to decide what to do with us. They left and went back to the star cluster that he showed me, wherever they're from. And half of them thought that they should just leave the Earth to us, that we had earned the right to live. But a small group of these blondes thought that we shouldn't. You know, we were created, so we should be destroyed, and felt sick at the very idea of us being here, and that their DNA was in us and wanted to destroy us, but that wasn't allowed. Well, they ended up leaving, left us here, and that same group of these blondes that felt sick at the very idea of our existence somehow got back here to try to destroy us. The blondes found out about it, so they come back to stop these blondes that were trying to destroy us. The bond that they felt with us was as if we were their children. They didn't want us to die. So they came back, and there was a war between the group of these blondes that wanted us gone and the group of these blondes that wanted us there to take care of the earth. And on one side was the greys and the blondes. The greys were genetically engineered. But on the other side, I saw a picture of what looked like it was the side that wanted to destroy us was also the grays, blondes, and also saw a picture of what looked like a lizard-type man. How did the lizard man get into the mix of all this? 
the way he explained it is they're not the only technologically advanced beings in the galaxy. There are many. And these, I guess I can call them reptilian, they're like nasty. They're bad people, I guess. The blondes that broke off, they needed help from somewhere if they're going to destroy us. Uh, so they made some type of agreement. And they're working together to get rid of us. And there was a big war between both of them. The blondes that broke off and the reptilians and the greys that were with them, I guess, at the time. Apparently, the good blondes won and banished the blondes that broke off away. But the blondes, they're still coming back, trying to destroy us in a certain way. Now, whether or not that's maybe infiltrating our society to destroy us a certain way or plague, I don't know. But the blondes that broke off still try to this day. What about the serpent in the Garden of Eden? That could be it. It could have been a reptilian. Tempting humans to do what? Eat the fruit of knowledge. How would that destroy humans? The more knowledge you have, you destroy yourself. We're more apt to destroy ourselves today than we were 500 years ago. Because with technology comes power. So if you create a weapon, you're going to use it. So maybe they're just trying to do something like that to make us destroy ourselves. They don't have to do anything. You have to understand their thought process and the way they think is beyond our understanding. So what they would do wouldn't make sense to us, and what we would do doesn't make sense to them. After the war, apparently the leader of the faction that broke off was captured, and I got a picture of that in my head. He showed me that, of everybody being around, and he's in a chair, and something happens, and they send him away. They didn't kill him, they send him away. Okay, so the war takes place. The leader of the blonde faction that wants to eliminate humanity is captured and sent somewhere somehow. Yes. But since that time, the war has gone on sort of Trojan horse-like The factions that want to destroy humanity are working on the earth in human form. I guess so. And you suggested in your emails that there have been some sort of meeting between the tall blondes and government representatives here in the U.S.? Yes. What he showed me was about seven blondes in white robes with a dark sash in the middle, all standing around with men in suits. Now... If that was government officials, I don't know. Where were they? In a room. No table. It was a blank, white, walled room. No pictures. Did you have a sense of what year this occurred? I did. The humans, I guess, were dressed maybe 40s, 50s. What happened in this plain room between the seven tall blonde beings and what looked like government officials in the U.S. in the 1940s to 1950s? To me, it seemed like it was some type of an agreement between the humans and the blondes, maybe letting them know that they're here. If there were seven tall blonde beings, how many humans were in the meeting? Twelve. So what did he show you as the next image in your mind after seeing the room of 12 human men and seven tall blonde beings having a meeting, talking about some kind of an agreement? What was the very next image that the blonde man in 2012 showed you happen next? The next image I saw was of, I guess would be one of the blondes, but he had a white beard and his hair was white. I guess he was old. And he was standing in the middle of the room with a human in a suit. What they're doing with us, it's something to do with genes, maybe changing us in some way. And they are doing this through genetically manipulating sperm and eggs in current humans in order to make a whole new population of humans that will be different than the ones that the other blonde faction want to destroy. Yes. It wasn't anything as far as looks. It was something within. One thing he told me was the difference between him and us was the brain. They're able to use all of their brain, and we can't. And I guess we were made like that, maybe to keep us in line. You know, if you're just smart as the boss, then the boss doesn't like that. The blondes live way longer, and they're able to do things because they can use their entire brain. 
So humans were made with a restriction on what we could access in our brains. Exactly. Meaning that they have been trying to manipulate certain bloodlines for thousands of years of humans that they created. Exactly. And that today, some of you are the current human model from the genetic manipulation that the blondes have been doing on the earth. Right. What do you understand that the blondes want to do with humans now that are the product of all of the genetic manipulation for the past several thousand years? I don't know exactly what he wants to do, but I know that it's something to do with maybe making the entire population in a certain way. Tyler Jones is not the only abductee who has described a kind of civil war in the tall, blonde civilization. In my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, there is a 106-page chapter entitled Body Containers and Souls of Light. Several abductees recount their experiences with tall humanoids, some tall blondes, that are described by abductee Juana Lawson this way, quote, those tall blondes wanted to take a sub-creature and evolve it to the level that they were on and prove that this could be done, like taking animals and giving them the hearts of angels, close quote. Summarizing Juana Lawson's insights about the tall blondes from her November 1983 abduction in Pennsylvania, those extraterrestrials from another star system two million years ago decided to manipulate DNA in already evolving primates on this planet Earth. The idea allegedly began when the tall blondes built many large pyramid, obelisk, and sphinx structures on this planet for energy production, and then they got tired of doing the work themselves. Juana Lawson says the tall blondes then decided to experiment, to experiment by using some of their own DNA to create an earth creature that they could communicate with telepathically so it could do work for them. It's the same concept that Tyler described. The tall blondes wanted to make controllable worker beings for earthworks. And then that faction of controller tall blondes manipulated DNA in already evolving Earth primates and kept tweaking their various evolutions up to us, cro Homo sapiens sapiens. And during that evolution, those tall blondes tried to protect their humanoid experiment from another faction of their own tall blonde civilization that despised the Earth humanoid creations because our advancements were due to the insertion of the tall blonde genes. And that disgusted some of the tall blondes, and they decided to annihilate the Homo sapien creation that their fellow tall blondes had made. Juana Lawson says, as an abductee, quote, you have a group of tall blondes that is trying to defeat the other tall blonde experiment. You have a group that is doing everything it can to prove that the experiment was a fluke. They have tried to undermine from the beginning that they argued could not be done. I call them the controllers. They think humans are despicable, less than a roach, close quote. And I ask Juana Lawson, when anything feels hatred and wants to destroy, it usually means the destroyer is threatened by something. Why would humans threaten the very advanced controllers, the controller tall blondes? And Juana said, quote, you are dealing with an entity that feels superior and looks at humans as you would a roach or a bug. The controllers don't want to concede that the tall blondes that made humans by manipulating genes in a lowly evolving primate that the other blondes could be right, that lower life forms could evolve. The others are against that, do not want that to be supported. The bottom line is, it's a no-holds-barred battle. 
The tall blondes are not fighting each other. They are fighting regarding humans through humans. Remember that DIA analyst who told me that World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies? It's the same idea. In a way, it's a philosophical argument about how far DNA manipulation of life forms should go. The tall blondes who made humans think humans should now be protected to advance spiritually. Close quote. Now, I want to go to uh, the Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, that I was writing in the late 1990s. And in my prologue to that book, I began with what I consider to be one of the most provocative ancient alien and ancient writings ever found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the Testament of Amran, written in Aramaic and translated by Professor Robert Eisenman, which also has a theme of higher intelligences in conflict over what happens to humans. This is the Qumran Cave 4, where the Testament of Amran was found in fragments of Aramaic language that are at least 2,200 years old. In the second century before Christ, Qumran was the village where the Essenes lived in a common bond about expecting a divine Messiah to usher in a new kingdom on earth. In the second century before Christ, the Essenes began writing their mysterious Dead Sea Scrolls, first in Aramaic and later in Hebrew. The fragile scrolls were buried inside of hill caves Bedouins did not discover this Qumran K4 until August of 1952. Qumran is about 20 miles east of Jerusalem on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. After World War II, a Bedouin shepherd was first to discover the Dead Sea Scrolls in the first of 10 caves. The scrolls survived for at least 2,200 years because those desert caves were so dry that's why those original and very ancient Aramaic words in the Testament of Amran are so intriguing and seem to echo what Tyler and Moana Lawson and other people in the human abduction experiences have been told about an ancient war ongoing from the days of temptation by a reptile in the Garden of Eden. A reptile described as a teacher and a leader of forces in darkness and evil. Here now is the Dead Sea Scroll Testament of Amran. Quote, I saw watchers in my vision, the dream vision. Two men were fighting over me, holding a great contest over me. I asked them, Who are you that you are thus empowered over me? They answered, we have been empowered and rule over all mankind. They said to me, which of us do you choose to rule you? I raised my eyes and looked. One of them was terrifying in his appearance, like a serpent, his cloak, many colored, yet very dark. And I looked again, and in his appearance, his visage like a viper. I replied to him, This watcher, who is he? He answered, This watcher, his three names are Belial and Prince of Darkness and King of Evil. I said to the other watcher, My lord, what dominion have you? He answered, You saw the viper, and he is empowered over all darkness, while I am empowered over all light. My three names are Michael, Prince of Light, and King of Righteousness. Close quote. Perhaps the highly classified MJ-12 group, appointed by President Truman in 1947 to study the UFO phenomena 
and then President Eisenhower's alleged face-to-face -face meeting with either a blonde Nordic type or a gray artificial intelligence type or something that we don't know, is how they learn that Earth is a laboratory, that many types of other intelligences experiment here on our planet. And according to whistleblowers, our current species of Homo sapiens sapien is one of the experiments. But the ET manipulators have wanted that kept secret, and human power brokers were glad to keep the secret. But now it seems like something else is pushing hard against the policies of lies and deceptions, wanting the truth to break out. Will some of the friendly ETs be able to save Earth from persistent tribalism that has kept humans fighting against each other instead of the much better path of peaceful alliances that help everyone? It feels like a lot now in 2021 is hanging in a very, very uncertain balance. And about to burst into the big hall of destiny is the mind-cracking truth. We humans are not alone in this universe, and we deserve to know who made us, who hates us, who loves us, and who wants to protect us. Now, for those of you who would like to go over Tyler's interviews and see a lot of the images involved with that report and others, please go to my Earth Files News website for the seven-part series that began on March 19th through March 28th. The first part has the Tyler first part audio in it, and part two has the second part, and then it goes on fleshing out other very important aspects of all of this through part seven. And uh, what I would like to recommend is uh, that you go to www.earthfiles.com, my news website, to go through those seven parts and uh, to know that Earth Files is the great place to check in in addition to social media about what we are doing and what subjects are coming up. And that part one through seven, I do recommend. And for those of you who would like to make comments and ask questions now, Ian, the floor goes to you. Okay, well, thank you, Linda. That was an amazing interview again, and the amazing content that you supplemented that with tonight. Okay, it you. certainly sparked a lot of interest, a lot of comments in the, uh, in the chat. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Super Chats again this evening, to Moonbird, Jacqueline Merkitt, Crystal Lenglet, Jenna McHugh, Cat Chaser, Sexy Sadie, Jeffrey Rizzo, Michael Donahue, Mary Kelly, Jean Karcher, Dave Goodridge, Donna Bliss, and TNC. I think I've got everyone tonight. Wow. Thank you so, so much. All of it helps keep this going, and I greatly appreciate all of you. So, Ian, what is the first question that you've got on your list? Well, the first question is, uh, people are also relating uh, this story to the Zachariah Sitchin story, the Anunnaki. Can you make a comment on that as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. Parallels all over the place. Um, I have uh, been asked to read, and for some reason tonight, Chocolate really wants to get involved with our table, so I'm trying to uh, let him be involved, but not blocking the screen. Um, the story on the Anunnaki is sort of uh, the, maybe they originated in Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, and they had a war there. And it was between greys and talls that the talls were the Anunnaki and that the greys had a planet in that solar system. And the story that I have read in a French book that I was asked to read and do a book commentary to uh, a couple of years ago, the way they laid it out was that the talls in the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 solar system made a 
I guess you'd call it a secret run to the what was called the gray planet in the in the French book, uh, meaning a book of the or a planet with the grays, and that the tall ones in that same Zeta Reticuli one and two solar system wanted to get the genes from whatever the grays were because they're a mix of artificial intelligence and organic. So it's hard to know and even judge any of these alleged translations because none of us have been to Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 and know if this is makes sense. But it was the same story that the Talls wanted worker bees and they went surreptitiously to another planet in the solar system, brought back genetic material, started making their uh, gray worker bees, and then they uh, got into a war, and then they left and ended up on Mars, and they were there for a while, and then they had an attack by the grays. This story keeps going on and on uh, as a backstory to the Anunnaki, uh, we'll say the, all of this sandstone that is carved uh, with uh, the history, allegedly. And if this is all true, then the backstory on the ET interactions with Mars and Earth goes even to uh, a 37 light year away solar system going back who knows how far. So it's the same theme, whether you're talking about the Anunnaki or you're talking about uh, some of the whistleblowers talking today, it is exactly the same theme. A very smart, very intelligent, but I would say aggressive, tall species uh, that doesn't have any compunction about going to planets, uh, gathering DNA, gene genetic material, mixing and matching it for something that they want, setting it in motion, and then even some of their own deciding that if they use their genes, then they should annihilate whatever creatures they have made before they leave that planet that they have done the research in. So what is behind the same similar storyline, whether it's alleged Anunnaki translations, whether it's military whistleblowers, or a lot of the abductees who have the same sort of outline of talls that came from another solar system. They are the ones responsible allegedly for the maybe two hydrogen bombs on Mars that John Brandenburg has written about in Death on Mars. They end up on Earth. They do the same thing. They start doing DNA manipulation in the primates evolving in Africa. And two million years later, here we are talking through a digital world, hypothesizing about what could be behind the present, what we have as present evidence of advanced aerial craft that our own Department of Defense says are advanced aerial threats. And the word foreign adversaries are being used in the 180 day countdown. And are we now being maybe positioned to hear words that would be coming from officials that there may be something already in this system, or they have advanced knowledge because they are working with extraterrestrial biological entities that help our human level try to understand what is going on. I do not personally think that there is a threat, an imminent threat to the earth. There are too many whistleblowers who have talked about how our military is working with ETs in interstellar trade, going into other systems in the Milky Way galaxy, and I think it's true. So that would mean that we have collaboration with 
highly advanced other intelligences that can move point to point. They're not moving in Euclidean geometry, they're moving point to point. So as long as we have collaboration with advanced intelligences that can help us, then I think that maybe the foreign adversaries and advanced aerial threats, those words that are being used in, the, in anticipation of the 180-day countdown, certainly they are, are catching people's attention, those words. And threats always get more funding and congressional support than non-threats. And we're in a waiting game. Who will speak first? And how will they flesh out what we've been hearing piece by piece by piece? The latest uh, possible news is there have been rumblings that some people with firsthand knowledge have been approached to speak at the, the so-called countdown about some of the things that they know and that they have been pushing back. And that would indicate, if this is true, that not everybody is on the same square about what to do and what to say in this first round. But you guys, if we get official, official confirmation, that's what we need, from authorities, yes, we are not alone in this universe, yes, we have allies, Yes, we are going to start unfolding more for you, and we could move into an exciting 21st century not built on lies, but finally on truths, no matter how uncomfortable some of the things that our government has done to keep it all a big secret since World War II. It's way past time to tell us the truth and to let us know who are our allies, who are hostile, who are neutral, which is exactly what the remote viewers were doing at the end of the uh, 80s. And we'd have a whole new platform for discussion, education, all everybody evolving together finally. So I hope that's how this goes. I hope this is where it is headed. But you guys also know that Wednesday nights here at the Earth Files YouTube channel, we're going to be continuing to talk through the, the military whistleblowers, intel whistleblowers, the abductees, and the people who have firsthand knowledge that relates to this as long as we can. So either way, let's keep this going. Let's keep this energy that we are moving forward finally in some truths against centuries of lies. Okay, Ian, what about another question? Well, th this is just echoing the comments that you've just made, really, because uh, people are saying, if it was only the evil races or the malevolent races interfering with us, we'd probably be completely enslaved or dead by now. So it obviously is a, uh, a struggle between the malevolent and the uh, benevolent races as well. So I just wanted to add that to to what's, uh, what's being discussed in the chat. Also, moving on, uh, with the Tyler references to the pyramids, etc., Linda, how many different ways do you think that power spots on Earth are used? I have always thought, from many sources, that understanding the, the energy grids on this planet, or any planet, that ETs analyze with spherical geometry anything that they come to. And they are looking for what kind of, is there going to be, are there going to be magnetic fields because there is an iron molten core or not? Uh, are there going to be large spaces that have developed inside the interiors of planets and moons that the non-humans who know how to do this can access quite rapidly and create places that are inside like ready-made uh, underground places 
for protection and then using those areas to launch off in their exploration until they have settled on a planet that they look at as a laboratory and then experiment for millions of years as apparently this Earth has been done. So the energy systems in our planet, we have that huge, gigantic crystal iron core that is slowly rotating in this liquid of iron and some nickel, sets up the magnetic fields, also makes our planet unstable in the sense that volcanism has played a huge role on our planet's history. And we are still an active planet with potential huge volcanoes that could erupt. But the magnetic fields then give operational ability for advanced intelligences who know how to use magnetic fields and other aspects for uh, building, neutralizing gravity machines and invisibility, all of the things that are happening on this planet, that's what these advanced civilizations can do. And it's how they can be invisible in as many skies as they want to be invisible and still be interacting with surface populations on any planet or moon. And that's what has happened on Earth. And we have been kept out of the equation for the most part outside of there have been spiritual categories, there have been folklore categories, there have been mythology categories of high strangeness going back as long as humans began to write uh, in stone or clay. Working with the phenomena that we know today, that the grays, the blondes, the reptilians, all of them, they can be in a room and they can project uh, this invisibility frequency, observe us, be around us, and we don't know. Or they project themselves as something with wings. So we are beginning, I think, as a global population to catch up to the fact that we are on a planet that is alive, it is vital, it is unstable, but it has all the ingredients for why pyramids, obelisks, and the structures that advanced intelligences knew how to build on what magnetic field lines in order to have a power grid that Tesla said that we should be able to be on a planet where there was, would be energy at all times to everyone everywhere if we were tapping in to the magnetic fields and electrostatic energies with the kind of equipment that he was building. And there's got to be something about Tesla that had to be pointing in the right direction or the FBI would not have been ordered to go into where he lived in New York and they must have been monitoring him because of the rapid entry by federal forces to get a clean sweep where he lived and where he died because they wanted his patents. And Tesla's patents are one of the most valuable things apparently to a lot of people who would like to have access and be able to build these energy grids and do it, I suppose, in secret, but we are still in a capitalist mind where everything has to be done for profit. Uh, and the idea of a planet that had the ability that everybody anywhere at any time had access to all the energy that they needed, that that is a concept that we have to evolve and finally reach a new level on this planet, which is my prayer every day, that humans get past tribalism. If it is the bad blondes, bad reptilians who have, are trying to keep us at war with each other, it's another reason to defy them, to really defy them and go out every day and breathe in sun and no peace and love and approach everyone that way. And then 
Can you imagine what it would be like if we finally had friendly relations with greys, the artificial, we'll call them uh, their AI, uh, that can do so many things and that we'd end up on a planet where we would, could have trade with their AI and they could have trade maybe for maybe for the protein that they, some of them take in the animal mutilations. So I think if you, if you get past the idea that there has been a lot of evidence of perhaps violence in our past and Mars, and that we are in a different century and our government is already peacefully working with some collaborators on interstellar trade routes. And that's the direction to concentrate on. The future then isn't scary. The future is exciting and that maybe we will be in the halls of the cosmos. Homo sapiens sapien from Earth used as an example that you could take a primate on a laboratory planet, mix and match certain genes, and end up with an evolutionary creature that eventually the divine field itself would insert souls that even the ETs, as Terry Loveless says, the ETs would like to have a human soul, and they can't have it. And if we can learn what it is about the relationship between the divine field behind this huge cosmos and humans who have been abused in many different ways, maybe, maybe it's that. Maybe it's just breaking through consciousness in humanity that reaches out into the universe and we become an example of something, something extraordinary. The divine field working through a genetically created and manipulated consciousness. So I'll opt for that path in the timeline. <laughs> Oh, they're saying it's a bit out of sync and we never know why this happens. Do we want to restart? Is there, can I get feedback from you guys? I have no idea because I don't know that I'm out of sync. Tell me if I should keep going and, or should we stop and try? Ian, what are you getting? Um, I'm just checking into this uh, into the chat at the moment, so I'm uh, I'm not seeing anyone saying to restart or anything like that. And you're always uh, there's always a little bit of a delay here for me. Okay. But uh, no, everything is fine. Keep going. Okay. Right. Here, I think the consensus okay. is to to let's right. keep going, Linda. All right. And for any of you all out there in all the countries in the world, I'm getting a lot of letters from physicists, from engineers. Uh, if any of you can tell us, why does YouTube intermittently go in and out of sync? We try to do every single thing possible to prevent it, but it isn't just us. It is a, a something that seems to happen periodically uh, with YouTube. I would love to hear from those of you who really do know the science of what's happening in YouTube around the world. Why does it go out of sync sometimes and some programs stay beautifully in? It's very frustrating because we try so hard uh, to have everything work as well as we can. Well, let's go on to another question. And if I'm slightly out of sync, just pretend I'm in another dimension, but that we're communicating. Okay, Linda. Uh... Okay, we're going to go to a question on cattle mutilations now. Uh, there's some speculation about whether or not the cattle mutilations are um, being done. The harvesting of cattle blood and tissue is to repair ET's genetic defects. 
And do you know any sources who have said that the ETs are genetically deficient and hence they abduct humans and do the cattle mutilations to harvest tissue and blood for this reason? I think that Terry Lovelace is a keen insight. Um, he's probably one of the few, maybe the only abductee who has had the gray Betty physically talk to him a little bit. And he has gotten very clear images about the mutilations as being done by the reptilians. And that fits also into um, some of the Tyler interview. And it also fits in to the cases that I was investigating in Colorado when I was doing a strange harvest. And that after the first broadcast on May 25th of 1980, I began being just overwhelmed with phone calls and mail. And I do remember because it had always been puzzling to me and some of the law enforcement that I had talked about in some depth. If the mutilators are the creatures from outer space, as Sheriff Tex Graves said, which ones are they? Because even back then there were these descriptions. Some people said that they saw small gray bodies. Uh, there were two cowboys, I've got this in a newspaper someplace going all the way back to 1976, and two cowboys out in a ranch said that they saw two small gray, they thought they would look like little kids, rise straight up in the air and come right over the fence post of a corral, totally in control, and came down slowly into the corral and the cowboys were scared. They did not know what they were watching. They admitted it. They said, we ran back to the ranch house to talk with people there. What could this be? They went up in the air and they came down into the corral. So if those were, let's say those are the gray androids. There is a case, the Cimarron case, where a mother and her boy are driving. They hear a cow screaming when they see a silver disc in the sky. They hear the cow screaming. The mother stops, pulls the car over, and in the hypnosis that she did with uh, Leo Sprinkle long ago, the suggestion was that they were blonde-looking humans. Then there are the cases where I worked with a, a two psychometrists. One was in Canada and one was in working for Adams State College in Southern Colorado. And I had a piece of hide that had glowed right between the two eyes on a horse. And this was in the month after my broadcast. And it was a uh, interview that was done in Colorado Springs with a rancher who said, whoever has mutilated my horse has done embalmed him. And by the time I got to the horse, the horse had been there for three weeks. And with God as my witness, I walk with the rancher to the horse expecting to see the disintegration that usually begins to set in between uh, after maggots and things in the run. And this horse looked like it should get up and had these very neat rectangles of tissue, like three inches, two inches, one inch, three quarters, half inch, we measured. So it, they went in these diminishing lines going from the horse's penis and testicles, going across the sex organ in the testicles with these strange rectangular thin pieces of tissue removed. The rectum had been removed. And at, uh, uh, I was working with some uh, science people between New Mexico and Colorado. They said, take black light, get, get some black light frequencies and I got somebody to help me. 
And we stayed out there around this horse that looked like it should get up, except for these totally bloodless, very thin, precise excisions. And after the sun went down, we had set up, uh, as I recall, we had maybe five or six uh, different frequencies that you can get in black light. And this horse and everything around us, it was a dark horse, it was chestnut, is in shadow and the sun went down and it becomes black. We turned on these different frequencies of black light and right there, uh, we measured it at the time. I remember, I can't remember the specific measurement, but it was like two, two and a half inches across, three inches down on the horse's forehead to just between uh, coming down below the eyes. And it was a solid rectangle of a kind of orchid hue in the black light. It was the only place on the entire horse, a perfect rectangle coming from the forehead below the eyes. And I asked the rancher, I said, could we use your hunting knife? And could you carefully cut out this rectangle? I would really like to get it studied by a variety of people. And he was very nice and cut it out and we put it in a folded bag. And what I could do and talk with uh, scientists about doing this is I cut off a piece that went to a psychometrist to work with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada. I cut off another piece that went to Adam State. So I kept another piece that was preserved in a refrigerator, not a freezer, a refrigerator. I got a call from the psychometrist in Canada, and one of his first questions to me was, what kind of fire was there? I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I can't pick this up without seeing a blast of white light. And he said, I'm assuming it's a fire. The woman at Adams State College, uh, I called her. It was about a week after I had talked with, and neither one of them knew. I always keep things compartmentalized. So they didn't know anything about who else I was investigating with. I called up uh, the investigator who was working with the archaeology department in Adams State, and what she would do is pick up pottery shards, hold them, and tell the scientists, because she had this gift, she'd see the movies when she would pick up different pottery, and they knew that she was so good that she was giving them information that they were then going and reinforcing with investigations and finding whole new things because of this woman's ability uh, to see the movies of the use of the shards. So when I called her, because she had asked to have some time with it, uh, so I didn't have to be there, and she, it, it, literally the same question as the uh, psychometrist in Canada. Linda, what was the fire? And, and now I know, I, I don't want to cross-pollinate from him. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you see? And she said, tremendous white fire, but what puzzles me is it's cold. It's freezing. It looks like white fire, but it's freezing. And then she went on and said, and I see something that I don't recognize. It's small. It's not much taller than three feet. There are two of them. They seem to be working for something else that is there in charge. And they are there. This is exactly what she said. They are there to gather sustenance from, in this case, it was a cow or a horse, the, the horse, uh, to gather sustenance for whatever is in charge of them, but they are not in charge. These small childlike things that I see are doing the work. That goes all the way back to 1980. March 25th, 1980 is when a strange harvest first broadcast in the CBS station in Denver. 
And that's what a psychometrist who was working for Adams State College got. And the psychometrist in Canada ended up sending me a report. He was not as clear on what was generating the white, but he had this sense of fire. And eventually, I think when I got his report, he thought that the temperature was strange because he expected heat. And she immediately had said she, about her confusion. Now, people will say, well, psychometry doesn't prove anything. And proof is a difficult game in terms of getting things that are indisputably proving what is doing the mutilations. But I feel that I have collected enough tissue. I've worked with pathologists. I've worked with veterinarians on necropsies. I've worked with electron or, or uh, microscopes that can look at uh, tissue and define that it has been heated, but there's no carbon. The list goes on and on. Doing the soil compression tests where animals, one after another, in various parts of the country and Canada would be found having dropped from a height to the ground. And it is a genuine phenomenon that I think is related to the collection of genetic material to create container bodies to be used by, let's just say, a variety of non-human intelligences. Camouflage, container bodies, and sustenance. And the most consistent type throughout all of the people that I have talked to and interviewed that uses the extractions from the animals around the world for sustenance are the reptilian beings. And If I felt there was a threat, I would have reported that a long time ago, meaning to humans and ranchers. I have interviewed a lot of ranchers who have just been scared to death when they saw a beam come down into a pasture, saw an animal being lowered in the beam or being taken up in the beam. But nothing ever happened to them or their family. So I cannot guarantee and I cannot prove what these three competing extraterrestrial civilizations might do in the rest of this century. But I think the fact that we are here, we've been through tremendous wars as a species on this planet. There seems to be a lot of consciousness and energy of moving away from war, if possible, that would be a great step. Prove those blondes that felt they could make us better. But I don't see a reason for us to be afraid. I think this is one of those pivotal revolutionary moments. Everything is changing. Everything is changing. And we need to have a handshake with the good guys out there who have believed in us, who love us, who want to protect us, no matter what else is out there. Hang on to that. I love you guys, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. And I don't have to put
select a language, and the captions will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through, and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.